and from local bylaw, out of 13 section 5. This opening statement does apply for business conducted at this meeting. And for the record, this meeting of the commission is being audio recorded. Attendance, please. T.J. Roby. Dave Mantu. Karen LaForte. No comments. Lon Lugwick. Frank Scalinger. We have 100% of our commissioners present and our staff present, so we will proceed. Our agenda, we can have the luxury of starting with the very first thing in the top, which is the review of minutes from January 4th. So may we proceed to that. <coughs> to any comments, corrections, or motions regarding the minutes from January 4th. Okay. Now that will we accept the minutes from January 4th? Yes. Actually, I do see one thing. I'm sorry to... Um, it says <coughs> in the uh, bottom of the first page is regarding the Osprey Dragon Boat Team. They are 501c3 nonprofit. I believe they said their application was pending. No, they said they got the answer. Oh, they had they received the it. Yeah. All right. Good. So they, they... They said they just got it. Originally were, and then they came in all freshly approved. Right. Okay. So there's been a motion and a second to approve the minutes of January 4th. Further discussion? Hearing none? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Five, zero, zero. Minutes are approved. And we have on the schedule for 7 p.m. a continued notice of intent regarding a potential project at uh, Zero Equipment Street, uh, DEP file number SE175-0749. Uh, I understand we received communication from the applicant regarding this. Maybe our staff can share that or hand it to me and I will read it. Okay. This is from Edward Jacobs, who is with uh, PMP Consulting, who is representing the applicant. This is dated Friday, last Friday, the 13th, uh, 2023, 3.39 p.m. So uh, this is addressed to our, our agent, uh, Dr. Spellinger. My client, Mr. Landerville of BLR Built, has made the decision to withdraw this project from consideration with the Conservation Commission. And then he, he thanks us for it and says it was enjoyable to work with us and looks forward to working with us in the future. Who knows on what. But this project appears to be, not appears to be, is being withdrawn. And therefore, we need to acknowledge that. Uh, uh, any guidance from our staff on the exact wording of a motion to accept that? Just I do see the guidance. Just have a motion okay. to accept the withdrawal and close the hearing. Okay. So the chair is open to a motion that will close to close the hearing without a finding and without prejudice for Zero Equipment Street map. Oh. 109, Plot 70 for Jeffrey Landerville, BLR Built, LLC, represented by PMP Associates. Do I hear such a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. 500. We accept their withdrawal of the project, and I'm sure there'll be communication as needed about that. Thank you. We have no specific appointments. Um, we do uh, have a few discussion items here. Actually, one item I think does deserve mention, even though I don't know it's listed here. Uh, it's this uh, again, Chris. Okay. Okay. There was a uh, an appointment letter sent to this gentleman here. But we detected a couple of errors in it, and I know that the uh, town administrator's office was working to correct those errors and sort of redo the paperwork. It had the name of the position wrong, and halfway down through the letter, it talked about another board that wasn't even us. So uh, we thought the record should be made correct <laughs> because we have associate members. We don't have alternate members on the commission. Uh, I'm sure that will be promptly dealt with, and uh, we look forward to that being done. And then. You can get all sworn in. That would be great. Thank you for grasping and appreciating that. Uh, 
There is another item which isn't specifically listed, but it's very, very important. Um, uh, some of you may know, and uh, it's really quite recent, um, there has been some activity down at the Morse Brothers Bog on White Oak Brook in the southern part of town. And uh, our agent, it, it came to his attention through another board, I think the board helped notice silt in White Oak Brook way down on Pleasant Street. And upon investigation, the source was found to be work going on at the bogs uh, a ways upstream, and uh, it impacted the stream. And uh, our agent, Dr. Skillinger, uh, in company with Andrew Plant, who is with DEP, visited the site, observed what was going on, had some discussions there. <coughs> and the bottom line is um, DEP advises that the Conservation Commission should order should issue an enforcement order to Morse Brothers because of the situation that caused the White Oak Brook. So that was being drafted, I believe it has been. And uh, so, oh that, we hate when this happens, because we'd rather not have to enforce things, but it's been by uh, hand is forced and we will. Uh, Accordingly, this, this paperwork has been put together. It's Wetlands Protection Act Form 9, enforcement order, and the, the wording is in here. Uh, I'll, I'll cut right to it. it um, the, uh, there is a five-point uh, set of conditions, and then there is a description of the, of the activity that was going on and other documentation. So um, we'll be entertaining a motion. Uh, any questions before we get to this? So a lot of the, the descriptions in the paperwork, so we'll yes. find out what's going on. Yeah, and, and uh, I'll invite our agent to briefly describe it, too. Uh, maybe we should just do that now, Frank. Good idea. <laughs> before we vote on it. So, so uh, the health uh, agent reported that he observed the uh, stream running dirty, silty. So, uh, on Monday last, I went down to uh, the stream, which crosses Pleasant Street, way down near Woodbine Avenue, and sure enough, it was running very silty. I, I believe that uh, uh, Gil also got word from uh, a neighbor down on Woodbine Avenue that that was the case. So I. Uh, consulted with Gil and we we decided to uh, investigate where it might come from and the only place we could think of was uh, the Morse Brothers Bogs which is off of Hill Street which is right about where the railroad is where the railroad crosses um, uh, Montponsa Street but anyways so I went down and visited and uh, on that day, uh, they were pumping water out of uh, the bog beyond the railroad tracks into the brook. Um, and they had a very large pump, and it was pumping at about 12,000 gallons a minute, and it was pumping dirt into the stream. So I, uh, I informed Morse Brothers I informed the uh, person that they have doing the work down there, and I also called the DEP, hoping that I would get some um, advice from them. And the, uh, the people who were doing the work on site uh, shut the pump off right away. And... Um, I wasn't able to get a hold of the DEP until the next day. I went down again to verify the pump was still off. It was, and the, the uh, stream was beginning to clear, so the silt was ending up on the bottom. Um, I did hear from the DEP, and the DEP uh, representative, Andrew Point, said he would come up and view it. His concern was that uh, 
what was being done on the site perhaps would invalidate the uh, farm uh, uh, exemption that these cranberry growers have. So on Wednesday he came and we met down there, pump still off, uh, and we walked around the entire bog and his only advice was they they cannot put silt into the stream, period. So he advised that we should write an enforcement order to have the uh, owner, Morse Brothers, uh, clear the silt from the stream. And his, after talking with people down in Lakeville in his office, uh, he advised that we should tell them to remove silt if the depth of the silt on the bottom of the stream was four inches or more. If it were less than that, to just leave it alone. Uh, so that's the way I wrote the uh, enforcement order. Go into the stream, measure the depth of the silt as you go downstream, and when it is less than four inches, stop. And then in that area where it's four inches or more, you need to take it out down to the original uh, substrate for the, for the stream. I I put, a, I put the conditions on there that they would uh, come up with a plan by the end of February that they would uh, um, have the work done by the end of April. Um, it's something they have to do by the end of March. Why don't I skim through it because you wrote a very concise list of things. Okay. This is the enforcement order conditions that, that was being proposed that we would be issuing. Um, and this was issued, uh, would be issued with under today's date. Number one, prepare a restoration plan, including the following requirements by February 28th and submit it to this commission. Number two, measure the depth of the newly deposited bog sediment in White Oak Brook downstream of the bog outlet uh, as far as sediment depth is greater than four inches. Provide a plan slash sketch showing this determination to the commission by March 31st. Number three, remove the sediment to the original substrate in all areas and locations where the sediment depth is greater than four inches. And do this by April 30th. And number four, monitor the dewatering, I guess the ongoing dewatering, to ensure no additional silt is introduced into White Oak Brook. And number five, Hanson Conservation Commission shall be permitted to monitor the above efforts at all reasonable times. What were they trying to do by pumping out the brook? They're not pumping the brook, they're pumping the bog. The bog. Uh, what, what they are doing is they're excavating the bog okay. to make it a reservoir. And they're taking the, the excavated material and moving it up across the tracks to the two bog. There are, there are four bogs up there, and two of them are being brought up uh, in height. Mm -hmm because according to the guy I talked to, uh, one of the uh, contractors, the, those bogs are too low. I don't know what that meant, but in any case, that's what they're doing. They're bringing up uh, those two bogs with the fill from this bog. Uh, and it will become the new reservoir for that set of bogs. Well, there must be another way to do it. <laughs> What they are planning to do, and, and which I have a plan for uh, from the en an engineer, Kevin Grady, is build a, a rock dam around the outlet to the stream and divide that space with a filter dam, pump into one side of, the, of, of this uh, basin, allow it to filter through this uh, middle 
dam and then pump it out of the other end into the stream. And uh, the engineer has assured us that the water will be clean when it comes into the stream. So in other words, construct a settling basin a settling. with a filter to yeah. extra clean silt water. Track. Yeah. A silt yeah. track. And so that's the reason why we have... Is this other work they're doing? This is not in our jurisdiction at all? It's not near wetlands or anything? The, the uh, cranberry growers have an exemption for anything they do inside their farm. Basically, it's an agricultural exemption, which, because everything they do with cranberries has to do with water, it's a pretty enormous brick wall around things we normally would have jurisdiction over. Okay. Uh, there have been conflicts a couple of decades ago in Hanson where a lot of work was being done, and for whatever combination of factors were involved, um, the Conservation Commission was not listened to, even though we thought. We, I was not on the commission at the time. The commission at that time thought violations were occurring above and beyond the agricultural exemption. In this case, DEP saw with their own eyes and, and said this, and, and the people are seem to be understanding that. Um, it'll be informative to see them carry out these steps and, and monitor it as time goes on. Um, so that's the upshot. Uh, this is the enforcement order, and we do need to uh, uh, basically have a motion to approve this enforcement order uh, as prepared and before us. And uh, further discussion is fine. And this, this, we seem to be getting there, I think. More thoughts, comments? I do have a, a, a hope, and I don't know, Frank, if this is when you're going out, but possibly what they're doing is maybe they're creating a tailwater reservoir. <laughs> is it lower? Which actually is a good practice because when you drain a bog after having flooded it for whatever reason, instead of the water going directly into a natural stream, if you collect it in a reservoir, let's say it maybe has fertilizer in it or pesticides. Uh, it doesn't go into the stream, and they have the option of pumping it back up onto the bog again from there. In other words, not wasting the water, and whatever additional materials might be in it, not necessarily might be in it, uh, would be, you'd, they'd get all the use out of that, that fertilizer that they could and reduce the amount that goes into the stream. But we shall see. So the chair awaits a motion to approve this enforcement order as described in this printed here. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed? Same thing. Five zero zero. The motion is approved. I'll sign it and pass it along. Economically, it's interesting that people are still investing in the growing of cranberries in the town of Hampton and paying taxes on the property or whatever rate. But they can't do this stuff like that. It's not doing the thing. It's agriculture. It's, uh, yeah. It's beyond natural. Probably the kindest thing you'd say is it just seems kind of careless. we proceed with that signature, the next thing on our list here is the Wildlands Trust Stewardship Endowment fee for this conservation restriction, restriction number five. I can report to the commission that um, last week the Community Preservation Committee uh, received our Part A application for seeking the 11,000 and whatever change it was as proposed by Wildlands Trust to endow this, this uh, uh, steward shipping. The uh, Community Preservation Committee was extremely supportive of that and seems to be a, a slam dunk to approve the Part B when we give it to them at the next meeting in February so that it will be proposed 
to the selectmen and then put on the agenda, hopefully for the spring town meeting, so that the 11,000 and change to fund this endowment for this CR will will not deplete our conservation fund. So it was again, it was very well received. Uh, and turning to the staff, um, I don't remember how, how little or how much we might have discussed that at that point, and you mentioned it should have if I didn't. Uh, what that means, though, is we should uh, tap the keys of the keyboard and create a Part B application, and I can assist with that if you have any question at all. Um, it was, uh, I think, apparently the right thing to do, and so let's do it. When's the next CPC meeting? Second Wednesday of February. And the timing is such that that should be, without a lot of extra time, have everything ready to be proposed through the selectmen to be on the warrant for this May 1st town meeting. What are you doing there, Ed, with the signing? Control set? What is it? No. Oh, good. It's on its way down. I've never seen one before. Uh, next, unrelated um, to the yes. bill. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Unrelated to the stewardship oh. endowment fee, but related to that same property. Yes. We had previously forwarded a list of neighborly concerns to town council. We have not, but while holding that very appropriate question in an open hand here, I'll say that um, just within the last 24 hours, both the office and I were personally contacted by the sellers of the property. Uh, uh, one, Mr. Peter Bickford, who's the spouse of Johanna Sleeper Bickford, and she's one of the primary trustees of this. And, uh, all is positive in their view of things, and you know, there's as sellers, they they're happy with having repaid and everything. Uh, but this relates to something that might happen near the entrance there. Uh, it is their desire, which they would fund, to place a small plaque, which is yet to be specifically designed, basically acknowledging their parent, uh, one Mr. Myron Sleeper who did a lot of legal work to consolidate it into that 113-acre parcel. I should say that collection of parcels that looked like a single parcel. <laughs> uh, and his, his desire all along from years and years ago was to have it be, uh, remain in its natural state. And his, uh, his son, uh, Myron, who is also close by his mother, and his daughter, Johanna, uh, on behalf of the family, they made his wishes come true. And I think understandably they wanted to acknowledge this. That's not seen every day, although we wish it were, that kind of spirit of conservation in, in people who own land. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, he, when he called me, which was, um, uh, again, just, I think it was just late yesterday, uh, we had a, a, a terrific, very positive chat. And I didn't go into great detail about other things happening about that, but it, we didn't say exactly where this thing would go, but it underscored the fact that um, we, we will need to, um, in a way that doesn't tread upon the actual rights such as they might be for any landowners or for any property owners nearby, uh, make our plans and carry them out for uh, access at this point. I thought that there is a, I think there is a chance that we could, uh, in cooperation with the, with the sleeper family, with, with, uh, with those folks, maybe have the plaque put at the other end where the base circuit trail goes by. But on the other hand, I think that their wish is to communicate to the public what what the family's wishes have been for a couple of generations now, and now they finally come true. So, uh, don't have guidance back from, from town council, but I think I have talked to the staff a little bit. I think some of the 
thoughts that I had put together regarding the, uh, the, the neighbor's question, questions or concerns were a little overly wordy. I think it's just way to simplify what we say back. Uh, we don't wish to interfere with people using the driver. We don't wish to interfere with that driver using anything. We, we are not going to take the plow in that driver. <laughs> not our driver. But, but we do own all that land. And everything beside the paved driveway, and we do own a certain access to the and we will do a few things uh, when we're ready. Uh, so I, that short answer to your question, TJ, is uh, no, we haven't heard back from town council. But the, uh, the intentions and desires of the people who brought this to the town to begin with are such as described. Uh, not a bad thing. Uh, so, in conclusion on that, I know my own latest round of thinking has been like within the width of the space that we have there, what about, and this is just brainstorming and not with great decisions here tonight, but please do think about this. If there were a footpath beside the driver, parallel to it, away, so that if someone when the day comes that the Quasi project happens and there's a sidewalk, someone could walk from the sidewalk along the footpath and enter that property and know where they're going and why and have every right to do so. I think that's that's my latest thought and you know we can through town council just validate all those those points. How wide is it? Um, do we recall it, it's at least forty feet. Forty feet, okay. And the paved it's piece. wide enough so that if they had wanted to sell it for development they could have Yeah, if the Sleeper family had wanted to just put it on the market and, and you know sign a PNS that maybe the town couldn't have matched. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but that's not gonna happen. Uh, so we shall continue to work on that. Uh, property management. Oh. Well, one oh. other oh, one sorry, question sorry. on that property. Um, there is the open matter of the um, conservation restriction. Sorry. Oh, yes. That's uh, right. They were going to be signing that. Uh, which I believe the status is that they're going to sign it after they get paid. Is that the idea? Uh, oh, you mean uh, Wildlands Trust? Yeah. I don't know. Have we finished signing it on this end that the the newly uh, rearranged Board of Selectmen has signed it? We have. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So the the open issue is that it gets signed for the other end, and then I go to the registry and to court. Okay. But I can't do that until we pay. Yeah. And they sign. Something that the chair has not yet done, but I will do, and feel free to remind me by email tomorrow uh, to contact the Wyoming Trust and tell them because they may not know that we have uh, with this uh, virtual certainty we've secured the funding to pay that fee but it might not be for a few months well because town meeting hasn't acted and it, you know, we, we only have the money when we have it uh, but to me it would seem to be that would be good news and they could confirm that sequence of events, and then we'll know. Um, other property management? management uh, well, just uh, there was not much. Uh, Chris, Chris and Don cut the trees out of his town forest and brought his trail. Thank you. And then he and I went and picked up trash at Poor Meadows. There's a lot of trash there along West Washington. Along the frontage? Or yeah, not, not on the property. Um, that's, that's just a, that's West a, Washington Street is quite a cut through thoroughfare and it's Route 14. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would pick up both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. We got mm -hmm. two So I got it last week and it was bad. Yeah, well, um, this was, I was going to do it on the same. Any, any extra adjectives, Chris, besides bad? <laughs> or how it was? Or any interesting items found? There's always interesting items. Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll leave it at that. <laughs> So anyway, the big up that there was a little bit of trash and and looking at the tree and a little bit on the smitties. Uh, going forward, Chris is going to take care of uh, taking the trash situation on Indian Head Street, 
at the town park and at Smitty's, and I'll keep doing Rocky Run and uh, I'll do the rest of them. And uh, so I'll have some help with that. There was a tire on the dam down at Rocky Run. It was icy today. I found it. Uh, I told Chris about it. He got the trees and went down there to get the tire himself. This was like a week or so later. And it was gone. Sure enough, I went down and it's gone. So water's up the tire down the river somewhere. Oh, so it might be in Pembroke right or Hanover by now. No, it's no longer our problem, but it's probably in the river. Uh, the other thing is... Probably not the only one. Uh, we need... We get a donation from Marianne, right, Ron? Yeah. And once that's accepted, I would like to use that money, maybe a little more for me to, and Chris is willing to help, uh, put bog bridges in uh, uh, Fort Meadow. It needs five or six of them. People are starting to create their own trail in there. I'll get all the fixes to that. Because they're going around wet spots. And they're going around it or they're filling it with, with you know, brush. So they're way human. We've got to get that fixed. It's getting worse every year. So I had mentioned also that the Boy Scouts is interested in doing some type of work well, like that. Yeah, like it's fine. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Bridge yeah. Was there a communication, a written communication along with the donation or the or the offer to donate from She sent me an email saying that she also wants to help build them. Uh, uh, I had sent her a, a note after I talked to Lon suggesting that if, if she was concerned that, it, that the donation be placed specifically at Bond Bridge because she write it on the check. I don't know if she wrote it. Okay. I have to double check with Sorry, But she may not care. Right? I mean, yeah. so she's, she's aware. That's great. Um, without interrupting any more than I have to, I'll just say uh, I think the staff has kind of looked at how the accounts are set up, this breakdown of our uh, accounts, and there may be a place uh, which that can go in, but the, the hurdles that have to be passed is uh, presumably be a check and Selectman should approve it as well as... We have to check. Yeah, we got it okay. in yesterday. So we'll be on the Selectman's agenda? It'll be on our next agenda, and um, then select board's next agenda okay. after we approve it. Right. So within a few weeks, right. that so will what be... What I'd like to do is once it gets approved, is actually take advantage of that. Yes. Go purchase the materials, and however the project team gets assembled, yeah. get some bond purchases. Well, Chris and I do it anyway, and Mary Ann wanted to work on something with her husband, so... Fine. Um, I'm going to do the voice stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah. Work on the um, town forest. Area. We could use uh, some work in town forest. Yeah. Because yeah. these things, besides buying the materials and, and then putting you know, the bridge thing together, uh, there's a fair amount of lugging required. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more uh, willing hands and backs and feet you have, the better. Yeah. So we'll, I'll build them the same as we did at the uh, town forest. Right. So that's another advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we might need to make a little uh, uh, a little bridge in one place that we did with town forest. One, one of them is actually a... Enough of a yeah, slow yeah, yeah. So one of them might have to bridge it. I'll, 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 see, I'll see about that. The option would be to make a bog bridge, but just build it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, too, as we go ahead with this, at some point we'll acknowledge in our minutes that the project is proceeding and then it is done. And I think it would be a good practice to reference in our minutes our uh, blanket PO, our, our blanket uh, notice of intent number for DEP because that's what we would be using as our uh, regulatory uh, coverage for doing right. the work in these wet areas. I still have that handwritten sign you gave me a long time ago. You want me to put that up when we're doing this? Um, we have wooden ones too. Yeah, we have wooden ones upstairs in the office. Well, my husband made they, them. Uh, they're, they're sort of like, instead of being black on white, they're white on black, but they have all the information. But I, only, um, I think I'll leave that to your judgment. If, there's, if it looks like it's something you might have a question about, you can do that, and maybe that's a good idea. Well, Just town forest, proactively. We did the town for half a day, so we wouldn't be reading out of the town. But anyway. But the record will have that. Uh, if, if that's okay, uh, then I'd like to really do that once we get this. Mm -hmm. Um, shall we have a motion to uh, accept with gratitude the donation from Miriam Damasio and, and apply it as discussed? So move. Second. Discussion? Mary none? Oh, is there a question then? Quite. Does this mean we don't need to discuss it at the next meeting? Is this instead of discussing it in our next meeting, can it go to. Well, let me, uh, let me clarify a little bit. Um, 
we're happy to accept it uh, pending the, the process of doing it, right? Uh, I think we should throw into the motion a, a written thank you note, written thank you letter to the donor. Uh, that's, I think, the very least we can do. How much was the check for? $250. So we may need more money. Yeah, so Which is fine. That's totally fine. This this will again no. <laughs> it will it will uh, uh, it's nice to supplement the fund that we have uh, so that maybe we can keep doing more and more significant things. Uh -huh. So who knows if we may need to approve something else further on with another motion, but let's uh, let's act on the motion to accept the gratitude and send the and you know to the donor for this. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Thank you. Time's in there. Um, other property things? Well, I'm still getting comments from uh, the postings on Facebook of your uh, stocks up here. Flying Hill Trail. I have a question for you because you assisted with that. Um, we invited people to, at the end, to go over and take a look at uh, what we believe is that charcoal pit. Were there any comments on, on that? I mean, did people go, huh, what, what the heck is this? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, there was well, quite a few people went in and followed me in there. Yeah. And a few of them expressed amazement. They didn't know, didn't know anything about the whole operation. Of this thing. And on that topic, and Mr. Peel will perhaps back this up, um, when an archaeological survey was done for the town of Halifax a few decades ago by a professional firm, one of the types of field findings they had in at least three different places that looked at the map it was charcoal pits oh, yeah. in Halifax. Okay. Uh, so I think virtually all of the towns around here had such things and at one time it was very, very significant for the industry and it showed how they used to use resources, yeah. namely trees. <laughs> well, well, speaking of that, uh, any progress on the science? Um, not much because the last two times the park committee was supposed to meet. We didn't meet. It turned out the first one was on January 2nd, which was the observed holiday. And the second one turned out to be the observed Martin Luther King birthday day, plus bad weather. So it was uh, on the it's agenda. going to be on the agenda to, to approve or yeah, think, slightly modify that. Because we, we want those things to be done. We know there's a strong public appetite for that information. Right. And no reason to not do it. Right. Well, it's all good news. Thank you. Anything else? No. Um, next item here, I see listed separately, Base Circuit Trail. We do not yet have a um, an alternative date. It was going to be the other week, but for the uh, trail maintenance uh, manager to come down and look at, at the Bonnie Hill Trail project, uh, hopefully that will happen soon. I've heard that there have been medical improvements and this person will be available in the not too distant future. But something that is apropos to this topic is we know a few miles to the southwest where the base of the trail comes into Hanson from East Bridgewater, it crosses a bridge across Pullman Brook and enters the Smith Nowzelki conservation area. Um, the the Bay Circuit Alliance and Appalachian Mountain Club uh, the, our same contact people called me to see if there were any other sections of the trail that needed work. Yeah. And I pointed out to them that that bridge, even though it's in East Bridgewater, really does need work. It's it's a very, uh, shall we say, key structure. It's not a small stream. It's a good sized stream there. And it's a very long bridge and, and apparatus there, board one. Uh, so uh, the Southeast Mass chapter of the ANC wants to do projects like this. Well, they worked on that already. Well, I'm done. When you say already, how recently? Two years ago. Okay. Well, now it's now. And there are right. probably more things, as you say, if it's not done. Uh, the uh, the AMC, the, the basic uh, supervisor, Craig, uh, Kristen Sykes, called the uh, the head of the East Bridgewater DPW, whose water department division has he controls the access from that side, and uh, they had a good course of conversation. They're going to talk again about specifically planning to allow access for that work to be done in East Bridgewater by other people, not us. Uh, so the trail is going to be enhanced 
And we should, at a point when our our time and thoughts allow, plan how what's needed to improve the trail on our side of town. Well, you, you talked about rerouting that trail. Yes, we did. And it's been a while since we've done anything effective about that. Maybe that's something they... It wouldn't be that big a deal, I don't think. We really. simply need to conceive and sketch what's needed and uh, give it a set of a sort of approval we need to under our blanket notice of intent. And I think they'd be eager to do it. I mean, you can you can walk it as it is. Right. So it doesn't have to be. Um, I think a new sidewalk would be good to do that. Uh, Bob Dillon, who until lately was uh, very active in open space and trails and whatnot, he and I uh, hashed out a plan, but we never brought it to actual action. Uh, it would relocate the trail mostly away from the power line. Right. Because there's some beautiful woods there. It would be nice to take advantage of them and, and treat hikers to some of the spectacular uh, woods we have there. There's, some, there's a really nice hill, and uh, it's not just a flat piece of swamp. It's, like, it's just nice. So um, at a time, probably not right now, but before full spring and leaf out happen, we should visit the site and yeah. see if they, the plan becomes more clear with them. Yeah, yeah that boardwalk, they did they had that weekend project. I was actually down to work on Yeah, okay. I mean, they try it, but they, I mean, it's a big job. What I hope is... A week later, somebody stole the, all the pressure treated uh, ramp going up to it. Yeah, there are some flat-out criminals yeah, in I mean, that I neighborhood. I mean, we had wind builders, I went back there for a while the next week, and everyone's gone. <laughs> Not not the whole project, which is that part of it. Screwed down? Yeah. It was it was it was a like a ramp and steps going up to the boardwalk. Yeah. And they took the whole thing off. There there is a group of people who, who I have no idea who they are except uh, that they like to ride quads and other off road things. That zoom around on the power lines there. They treat it as their own how I'll call it, uh, gang turf. Yeah. And um, there's a professor from Ridgewater State who is a pretty rugged guy, and he moved here from Texas, and we've got very engaged with trails. And, um, he was out there once because he lives near there, and he, uh, this is a few years back, but uh, there had been fires and things there, and he confronted them and said that it ought not to happen, and he actually felt seriously threatened. He was? Yeah, by these, uh, by these clowns. Um, so I don't know that we're in a position to wave a wand and, and make all that bad stuff go away. But that's what we're up against when it comes to maintaining. That's why when we build any sort of structure, be it a trail thing or something else, beware not only of regular wear and tear from the weather, but humans. So the less inviting it is, the better. And this, this bridge and boardwalk have been very inviting. Yeah. And for graffiti as well as a lot of there. You can still get, you can still walk it, but it's pretty. Yeah. Easy. If we had Daniel Boone go camp there overnight, and get evidence. But let's uh, stick to things we really can. Yeah, well, it'd be nice to relocate that to get that way the power lines. Yeah, yeah. the power lines are the loveliest thing. So, so that's that. Anything else, Dave? No. Uh, open space acquisition. Nothing new to report. Uh, before we get invoices, is there legacy, any other high legacy, priority items? Legacy tree. Oh, that's right. Over there. Yes. We. Um, I don't know we looked at. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I, you know, I did skip over it. My apologies. Um, second discussion item. The Department of Conservation and Recreation has what they call a legacy tree program, and I'll simply read the paragraph. Of, and maybe it's in your handout. I don't know. Yeah. Um, they recognize really big, fabulous trees. That's what it is. And they like to, almost like a little contest, um, find the biggest ones they can. And I think we have a nominee. Uh, maybe a few of you have seen it. There's a very, very large red oak on the Webster Building Conservation Area, right near the new well site. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, when they were preparing to go in and explore for water, 
we made them, uh, they actually did a tree survey because we told them to. And the water department and their consultants saw uh, the camp just on the peak. And one of the things they, they identified was an enormous oak tree along the uh, stone wall that ran along one of the ridges there. We made them route the, the road around it, not right next to it, quite a ways around it. And they were totally fine with that. And um, I went out and measured it with someone, and I could be wrong, I might remember it wrong, but the circumference is something like 168 inches. It's enormous. The diameter is probably pretty close to... Which about, is north. about a third of that. Yeah. It's, you measured the circumference like right on that? Yeah, at the, the breast height, BBH, the diameter breast height, about four feet up oh, is the standard up. place to measure oh. these things. And so it's probably between three and four feet in diameter. It's massive. And I went on the website of this program, because it's been around for a few years, and it's sort of like, maybe not at, but close to the top. There's some, some big trees in Massachusetts. And this is one of them. And uh, we think it's, it's actually a little destination. That nice new road they have there, which they continue to claim, one of them is to claim will be available for people to walk on. It could be part of a nice walk around the perimeter of the, the trail system for Webster Billings um, when we get that more or less optimized. So if we, we, if we get this, do you put some kind of plaque in saying this is the third? Well, we're not going to drill a hole to put the plaque on the tree. That's for sure. <laughs> they both nail it to the tree. So however this program works, it would actually begin with uh, filling out a form to nominate the tree and then uh, field inspectors from DCR or whoever they designate we come to double check, make sure we have the species. Oh, that's that's not an oak, that's a crack and fern. Did we get a chronicle after that? Um, so, somehow, I think this is one of those things you maybe don't publicize too much. It'll just. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> don't, in, don't invite harm to the tree, but people who would go there would go there because they, they want to see it. I attended a seminar on trees when I was agent of Halifax. And there were people there that couldn't believe that we still called five of them, we had. <laughs> There's people from like Beverly where they had a sidewalk tree that was, you know, oh, being yeah. carefully maintained and so on. But um, they mentioned this program, and uh, I think that um, one of the folks in Halifax thought he knew it was a huge beech tree, but it turned out it wasn't as big as he thought, but we measured it. Why wouldn't the tree, why wouldn't the tree up on King Street be a nominee? I was just thinking the same thing. It, it yeah. maybe very well could be. Uh, sycamore? It's a buttonwood or sycamore, yes. They call it a buttonwood. Yeah, but it's, but there's it's many sycamore. common names. There's one scientific name. Yeah. But I mean, that that's an obvious yeah. choice. It's right yeah. in the head on the line. Yeah. Yeah. And the, she said it was planted as a record of being planted. It was two of them. Right? Yeah. Only one survived. It was planted the day that Bunker Hill Bell. And they could hear the can in the distance because, of course, there was that much. There was far fewer trees in the landscape, and it was very, very quiet then. No traffic. So, you know how old the tree is? Right. Probably a couple of years old. A very large tree. Yeah. yeah. So let the, let the process begin. And I think when I look at the form, well, whatever the, whatever the form is. Does your form still live there? No, she does not. Okay. Uh, in fact, the people who do live there were before us right. with the application a while ago. Um, I think we kind of tried to float the idea of them planting another one <laughs> in case after 250 years this one starts to feel its age, uh, but I don't think that happened. So they were blocking it up, planting out of a tree. Well, something about the train <laughs> cost. Uh, no. uh, seriously, uh, I think. Um, the, the chair would be happy to entertain a motion to uh, to have the the, the staff uh, complete a nomination form for this oak tree on the Webster Buildings. So, do I hear a second? Okay. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? We have a unanimous vote. So, do you want to just send the form to the other people you're talking about? Do no. they have to nominate for the more? Well, I don't know. Uh, there would have to be probably a joint nomination. I wouldn't. It would be pretty rude to <laughs> in, in show up with an inspector, you know, when they didn't know about it. You know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So anyway, um, so that's the legacy tree program. Another way of, of approaching this, and I don't know, maybe there's one more program. Uh, there was a concept called the champion tree program. It may be simply related, whereby the largest tree of whatever species in each community and the largest tree of whatever species in the state certainly fit with this, but sometimes school children or scout groups or other, other conservation groups uh, have fun looking for giant trees, and this is a way to encourage that. Um, so, well, for what it's worth, there's a question on the floor about whether the nominator is also the landowner. In that case, no, um, you would not need to be the landowner to nominate. Ooh, well, we right. should still touch base with that. We should. One would hope. <laughs> One would hope. One would hope. Yeah. Chris, you got any big trees in your yard? Actually, yeah. Well, no, I don't own them, but uh, yeah, my house. Nearby. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they have any Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, after every storm, there's fewer giant pines. So <laughs> good luck to all of us. Um, I think we are moving on to the old business, new business of invoices. Oh, there is there is one other thing. I'm sorry. Um, some of you may recognize. Uh, is it in the handout? Uh, in the packet, you have uh, some photos of a bird a, with a long pointy beak. Uh, this is an American bittern, which is endangered by Massachusetts standards on the list. Uh, they like marshy areas which have become less and less common over the decades. And when you have an endangered species in your town, the responsible thing is to report it to the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program that Mass Wildlife runs. Again, like everything else, there's a form. <laughs> uh, but it, what's necessary is to have the actual information. You don't just put words down if you have photos and things like that. These photos were taken by Sue Gaspar. I think it's G-S-P-A-R, I think, uh, in this past May. And it's uh, in the southern part of Burridge, not southern, but the middle, which near the town line, but it was on the Hanson side of the town line. And she actually started calling. They have to make up sort of a, a pump. It sounds like a pump, a hand pump being primed with water. Uh, and the bird also has a, a cool habit, which is if they're standing, I think it's been detected, very, very shy. <laughs> It'll point its bill straight up at the sky so that it's parallel to all the cattails and the shadows. And if it feels wind, it'll slowly move back and forth as if it's a weed blowing in the wind. It, it ain't a dumb bird. <laughs> so, uh, to the extent that the staff has time, and I'd be willing to help them with this, um, with your knowledge and support shown by a vote, uh, I think we should do this. Do I hear a motion to submit this vision finding to the Natural Heritage uh, Program? So moved. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Uh, I saw one once when I was very small over at Indian Head Pond. My father showed, showed it to me. We were on a rowboat. And, uh, but I haven't seen one since. But now they're back, along with the giant sandhill cranes and things like that. Sort of a couple of Muscovy ducks. Okay. Muscovy? Yeah. Sort of domestic? Uh, they're probably domestic. Yeah. So I guess there's a population in Massachusetts. Not surprised. Where I would find it. Uh, <laughs> we have lots of ducks, both resident and seasonal migration, and uh, but uh, uh, most of those are a lot less rare than this. So good luck to all of them. Invoices, if we may. I just have one. We'll listen to our agent while we sign. Um, one of the accounts that we see on the current balance report that we get every month is the uh, removal of Fragmites at Camp Kiwana, and it still has $14,800 in it. So my question is, could we do something this spring? And if we and if we should, we need to start thinking about it now because we need to find somebody who will actually do whatever you want done. Did you say removal of 
Remove all side mighty. Put an invasive species. It's uh, one of the worst invasive species we have. Uh, the chair is open to any and all questions and discussions on it because I know a little about the history of what we've done so far, but yeah, we have a lot more to do and we have money to do it. We we spent a whole bunch of, of USDA money to attack the fragmites on the Smith's box side, but these are adjacent, so there's no doubt that we're back into Smith's box. And uh, at the time, I don't believe the, the, the stand on the Camp Corning side was attacked. So basically, it was pretty much a waste uh, of time and money to just do half of it. And uh, at this point, we either should attack the stand with this money or give it back. To, yeah. to flesh out the history, both the Camp Quarry frags and the ones of Smitty's, each one of them has, in fact, been attacked once. Uh, a firm from the North Shore was contracted to get rid of, to, to do a mowing and a clean out uh, in, when this is back when uh, Laurie Muncy was still the agent, uh, right near the gatehouse where the stream goes under the road and on the right hand side right there. And they did it, did a pretty good job. But they weren't as professional in executing the job as they seemed when they were awarded the job. And the proof of that was the next year, we wanted them to do it again. The same money, there's now 14000 left. And they promised over and over and over they'd be back, do it. And repeatedly, over like a month and a half, they said they'd be there. And they never, ever, ever showed up. So, so we never did a second cleanup, and and you would you can't tell right now that the frags were touched once. They were, but it doesn't show. So, you, what do they do? Do they take them off on the roof? So no, it's a multi-year thing. You have to do, I think, at least a three-year commitment, because the horizontal roofs, the rhizomes that spread under the underground and underwater and under everything, they are so vigorous and so fast and so. Um, Invasive, it it's beyond belief. So what you do is <clears throat> typically they go into an area and they cut down all the ones that are there, just sort of around the middle or even the latter part of the growing season. But an expert can tell us, and maybe they've changed their thinking. Of then when they're all cut down, we wait for them to start growing back. And when they start growing back, then what you do is you treat that with a very, very specific herbicide, which is approved for that purpose. And one reason for maybe doing it later in the season is because uh, not only are the plants growing up, let's say in August or around the first century, they're growing up, they're, that's also the season when they send nutrients down to the rhizomes to survive over the winter. And if they're treated with the herbicide then, they send the herbicide down into their own roots. And that works, at least mostly. And if you do this for three years in a row, you have a chance of getting rid of them. Mowing does not do it. Burning them does not do it. Only the combination of removing the tops and then sort of poisoning the, the new well, growth. Fifteen thousand dollars paid for three years. Under the old plan, it would have, but that plan is now coming up on four or five years old, so inflation probably says no. But we can only find out by asking, and I think reinitiating the project is the right thing to do. Um, my, my last question is: Once they're gone, do you, do you plant something native and replace them, or do you let nature do it? You allow cattails to take up that space. That's what they compete with, and they will. Cat, you will, you will cattails, allow the cattails are already there. Okay. But what happens is when frags move in, the cattails start to die out. They get overrun and disappear. You can find, you see a lot of wetlands where right here, there's cattails over there, there's frag, and every year the line comes closer and closer to it. Wiping out cattails. One of the wonderful things about frag is that if you cut, cut them off and drop the cutting into the water, 
they root, they grow. I know there's, there's many, many places in town that have them. Yes. It's not just there. Yes. And I've probably said this sort of thing before, but when I was a kid growing up in Hanson, we didn't have any. There wasn't any in Massachusetts. It, they introduced themselves. People might introduce them because, unfortunately, they have the most beautiful, feathery, tall, willowy tops. People think they look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they bring them home for decorations and things like that. And they might even plant them if they have a place. I don't know. Uh, that's the worst possible thing to do. And, but the, the seeds are spread by wind. They're spread by sticking to the muddy feet of ducks and other waterfowl. Uh, you could spread them uh, if you have them like in your boots or your pant leg or something like that, and you, you go strolling around in a marsh somewhere, and then you go to another place, uh, and, and one seed falls off and lives, uh, you're on your way. Well, I, for one, would be grateful if our dedicated agent looking to what our options are for people to contact. I, I would hate to have it so that we paid that and cut down but didn't have the money to, to treat them in the fall. You know, I mean, do like a partial job that's not going to work. Yeah. We need a, now that we have sort of gained a little bit more of a platform for uh, public appreciation for what conservation does, and my thanks to the you guys' work this past year, uh, and the town meeting and everything else, uh, and thanks to the expanded hours of our agent, we got a chance, I think, to do this. And a multi-year plan is the way to go. And we'll see. Oh, oh one, the, the last contractor, because there was a separate contract, a different one for each of the two projects that we did before. I described one whose name, I think it was New England Wetland Enterprise and some from up in uh, Ipswich. Uh, the other one was our friends uh, who also did the analysis of the Walfetch Pond, uh, uh, Solitude Lake Management. When they did the cleanup on Smitty's Bog, they had a machine, they did it in the Lake Park, it was called the Marsh Master, <laughs> and we actually had Tracy Seeley from the uh, Women Hanson Express come take pictures and do the story. So it was documented what was done then. Uh, so to me, Solitude, despite some of their slowness in responding to other communications should be on the list to contact about this. Um, so I think I just simply hear a groundswell of desire for that. Does anyone think we need to vote? Not yet. It's too soon. Our staff, I think our staff here is up. Yeah, I think we need to vote for Frank to get us. Yeah, I think when we're at the point of having uh, potential vendors known, to try to way forward to vote for that. Okay, we've signed everything we need to sign. What else am I overlooked? Yeah. I think we're doing well. Yeah. Um, at this point, it is 8.05 p.m. The chair is all ears for a motion to adjourn. So moved. No discussion allowed. All in favor, please say aye. 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 A